are beautiful beyond description. Majesty Our lesson tonight will be presented by our pastor, Pastor Brown. Hear ye him. We reverence God and thank him for our being here this evening. We certainly want to give honor and thanks to our superintendent, Brother William Collins, and to all of you who are part of our study this evening. We are making preparation for Sunday, August the 11th. This is lesson 11 in this series of study. And it's already been stated by a superintendent, the subject is the love of God. The greatest thing that we've received from God. And yet is the thing that eludes many people because they can't understand. I don't know why Jesus loves me. You hear him saying. But we're going to talk about from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10 tonight the love of God. Let's read King James Version, verses 1 through 10, 1 John chapter 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. 1 John 3, 1 through 10. Lesson outline for our study tonight. The first thing we note is the love of God, which is spelled out in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. We see there our identity. We see there God's purity. The second outline is the mission of God, which is 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. We see our situation and we see God's solution. And finally, the third part of the division of our lesson tonight is the children of God. We see a warning and then we see God's seed. 
we're in first John. Five books of the New Testament have traditionally been attributed to the Apostle John, who was one of the original 12 disciples. Three of the five, the ones we designate 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, are letters from the Apostle to various believers in the first century A.D., Church history strongly associates John with the church in Ephesus, located in what is known as modern-day Turkey today. Tradition says he died in this city in A.D. 90s. The three letters were probably written in the region of Ephesus. The letters date from the A.D. 80s through the 90s. John would have been an older man by this time. He calls himself John the Elder. The dignity of his age peeks through in 1 John as he addresses his readers as little children nine times. We are unsure of the issues that face the letter's original audience. Apparently they had been confronted with threats to their faith. Some of these threats included the temptation from an early form of attractive heresy we call Gnosticism. It's the same Gnosticism that Paul wrote about to the Colossians. Among other things, Gnostics taught that it did not matter whether a person had morality or love as long as he or she had secret knowledge. And the Gnostics, which Gnosticism, the word Gnostic means enlightenment, uh, receive more light. Um, and, and the Gnostics claim that you could only receive this special secret knowledge through them. But they had found the secret. In fact, Gnosticism says that Jesus was more enlightened than anyone else. He was not a God. He was just more enlightened than anyone else. See, they did not believe that Jesus came in the flesh because they said flesh is evil. And had Jesus came in the flesh, that would have made him evil. And therefore he could not have died for the sins of man. It is a, it's a twisted uh, religion based on knowledge, understanding, and I would say even some science thrown in. Uh, but the Gnostics were uh, a part of that apostate movement that worked against the, bis the basic teachings and the faith which Peter and Paul and Jude encouraged that first century church to contend for, that's the faith, and to fight against those movements. To combat this false teaching, here John emphasized the connection between right belief, right actions, and right love. Not just secret knowledge, not just the right knowledge, but right belief, right actions, and right love. The child of God must believe the truth. The child of God must obey the commands. And the child of God must love the brethren. False teachers were so bold that John referred to them as having a spirit of antichrist. John wanted their influence eliminated lest they split the church even farther. <clears throat> the church also followed a uh, face more general threats, including the denial that Jesus is Christ, which I just mentioned. First John 2.22 talks about that. A return to idol worship. And that's uh, first John chapter five, verse 21, and a general lack of love for one another. First John 4.7. So let's look first at the love of God. 
First John 3, 1 through 3, verse 1, talks about our identity. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. God, John says, had established the righteousness and that everyone that doth righteousness is born of him. John draws the attention of his audience to the love of God, the Father. This love was bestowed on humanity through the Father sending his only son, Jesus, to earth for our sins. There was nothing that humanity could do to deserve God's love. No amount of human love for God could influence what manner of love God has for humanity. But always remember, he loved us first. When people demonstrate faith in Jesus, they become sons and daughters of God. John 1 and 12, Galatians 3, 26. This adoption occurs through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit so that we might share in God's glory. Therefore, adoption into God's family comes not through physical birth, but rather spiritual birth, as Jesus uh, attempted to explain it to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. 1b, therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The underlying Greek word translated world appears 23 times in 1 John. If we were to count all of the uses of this word in the writings of John, it would probably total over 100 times. In John's writings, the term can refer to all humanity in general. The location where humanity lives or to the sinful individuals and structures that oppose God and his people, the world. It is the final option to which this verse refers. It contrasts to the children of God. The world has failed to know God and his abundant love revealed through Jesus Christ. In fact, the world tries to know God through knowledge. Amen. But then the scripture tells us we can't know him by searching. He reveals himself. Therefore, the world is also unable to know the children of God. As a result, believers can anticipate facing hatred from the world. And we need to know that the world is no friend. In fact, the Lord had to draw a line and says, you cannot love God and the world. There's an enmity. If you go after the world, at some point, there's going to be a crossroad where you're going to have to make a decision between a life pleasing the world or a life pleasing God. Verse 2, A says, beloved, now are we the sons of God. John uses the greetings beloved five times in this epistle. The greeting reveals the relationship that John had with his audience. Although he was an older man, when writing this letter or this epistle, he felt a close connection with them. In fact, he considered them his children, my little children. And most people, if they're in their right mind, love their children. He counted himself with them. We as being children of God. Verse, the B portion of verse two says, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. I'm not yet what I'm going to be. But we know that. He, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. As God's children, we do not fully know God's plan for our lives. 
but we know we will someday be changed. Hallelujah. I hear Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 51, uh, 15, verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound in the dead, and Christ shall rise, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. We shall be changed. What we eventually shall be has not yet been disclosed fully. Amen. I cannot fully explain the manifestation of Jesus after the resurrection. Even that night that he showed up and the door was locked. And some say he's a spirit. But then he turned around and ate with him. I don't know what I'm going to be like. But with Jesus, doors couldn't stop him. And ultimately, we see him riding on a cloud. I don't know what I'm going to be like, but we're going to be like him. Oh, at his second coming, we shall see him as he is because we will see him face to face and we shall be like him. At that time, we shall be like him. Christ will transform our bodies into something glorious. Philippians 3, 20 through 21 in and through this transformation, we will share in Christ's glory. Verse 3a says, and every man that had this hope in him purified himself. The verse before us contains the only usage of the underlying Greek word, a Greek noun, excuse me, hope. In any of the writings of John, in contrast, the Apostle Paul uses the term about three dozen times throughout all his epistles. This hope comes from what has been promised to believers regarding the future return of Christ. Hope, however, is not simply a positive outlook of feelings. Instead, our hope comes from the trustworthiness of God's character. I can trust God. That's my hope. I can trust God to do just what he said. We have hope because of what God has promised to do in Christ. This verse contains only the second usage of the Greek word translated purifieth in the writings of John. Thus, we have two rare words back to back drawing Attention, purifieth re refers either to ceremonial purification per the law or taking a vow when the word is used with a particular grammatical construction. Moral purification. His usage in the verse before us reflects the third option, even as he is pure. Verse 3b the antecedent of the word, he isn't the man. Just considered instead, he refers to Christ. It is he who is pure, meaning he is sinless. Christ's blood shed on the cross is the means through which our purification from sin occurs. We cannot purify ourselves even if we practice all of the ceremonial laws that are spelled out in the teachings of the Old Testament. It is only through the blood of Christ. This does not mean believers are off the hook from living upright and righteous lives. Instead, believers should purify themselves and avoid the stain of sin. That is to avoid being, but real purification that makes us like Christ only comes through the blood of Christ. 
such purification occurs when believers put an end to all sinful behavior. Amen. That's something to think about right there. Because some of us have put down some sinful behavior, but not necessarily all. As we do so, we develop lives of righteousness. John's directives in this verse mirror Jesus' teachings. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. Human perfection is impossible on earth. However, we should make every effort to live pure and upright lives as children of our perfect heavenly father. Because every time the reason human perfection is impossible on earth, because it seems like every time we get close to being perfect, somebody do something. Or we are doing something that disrupts our perfection. The second thing we want to look at, we look at the, at the love of God, the mission of God. And that's verses four through six of chapter three of first John. What's our situation? Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Having established the life of purity required for God's children, John presents the danger that believers face. And that danger is sin. The human inclination towards sin is unavoidable for all people, believers included. Scripture describes sins in various ways. Sin is foolishness. Sin is the opposite of faith. Sin is falling short of God's glory. Sin is a willful failure to do good. Sin is any unrighteousness. Ultimately, sin turned people into enemies of God. If you keep on sinning, it can turn you into an enemy of God. Perhaps you remember from high school English class that when you see the verb is, you can almost think of it as an equal sign. This equates the two sides of the sentence. That is indeed true here. Sin equals the transgression of the law. This verse is the clearest definition of sin in the New Testament. Perhaps you'd heard sin vaguely defined as the miss of the mark or so much or so something like that. But right before us now is the biblical definition of sin, transgression of the law. And what's God's solution? Verse five. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. The Greek word translated no appears about 15 times in first John. His use reveals the apostles emphasis on knowing the person and the work of of Jesus Christ. I said many times and many years ago, and I guess I don't say it as much as I used to, if you don't know nothing, you ought to know Jesus. You ought to know who he is. You ought to know where he came. You ought to know what that coming means to you and what it's going to mean to your time and your eternity. But simply having knowledge of Jesus is not enough. Instead, believers should seek understanding of Christ and conform their lives to that knowledge. Use that knowledge to make them like Christ. Only one person could take away humanity's sin, sins, and that's Jesus Christ. Only Jesus has the power to deal with sin because he was the sinless son of God. He and he alone could take away our sins through his sacrifice on the cross only because he was 
sinless. No sinner can die for the sins of other sinners. It took a sinless sacrifice. Hallelujah. It took a pure lamb, a Pascal lamb, to take away our sins. Verse 6 says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. So John begins a contrast of two types of people. The first is the person who abideth in Christ. Jesus taught that believers should remain in him because he is the source of their spiritual life. You know, in John chapter 15, I am the true vine. You are the branches. If you abide in me, hallelujah, I'm going to abide in you. Believers do so by receiving his teachings. We abide in him by not only receiving his teachings, but obeying his teachings. Doing so does not mean that believers will be perfect and without any sin. Rather, when we follow the perfect sinless Savior, we can pursue lives of holiness and righteousness. 6b says, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. The second type is the person who has neither seen Christ nor know him. Some people in John's original audience had apparently claimed that they could know God, but continue to live sinful lives. This false belief led to a strong correction from the apostle. It was not possible to both love God and keep on loving sin. If you really love God, you have to have that desire to let go of sin. Thirdly, the third lesson is the children of God. That's verses 7 through 10. Here's our warning. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doth righteousness is righteous, even as he, meaning Christ, is righteous. This phrase, little children, is a favorite greeting of the apostle John. His nine verse nine uses of the expression in First John reveal the care that he felt for the original recipients of his letters. They were all children of God, but John had a unique relationship with his audience, one like a spiritual father and his children. Some people in the community had attempted to deceive the believers. Some had led them astray from the truth. Although we don't know the content of their teachings, we can do a mirror reading in 1 John to determine aspects of our false doctrines. Gnosticism being one of them. Mysticism being one of them. Based on this verse, we can assume that these teachers had wrongly taught that a person could be righteous without behaving righteously. Y'all didn't hear that. They taught that people you could be righteous without behaving righteously. And there are some people that spend more time trying to defend themselves this time that they could use to get themselves right with God. But they got to defend themselves. Don't judge me because you don't know me. No, but the word don't judge you. And of course the Lord is. However, this verse does not mean that John taught a form of works righteousness. Humans cannot attain righteousness through their behavior. Only Christ is completely righteous. People can become righteous before God through faith in Christ. As a result of their being declared righteous by God, believers should live upright lives in obedience to him. God don't get the glory out of what we know. 
he get the glory out of what we do. But the more we know, I believe the more we do. That's why we ought to seek to know him. Verse 8, a portion, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. In contrast to the righteous person in the person uh, is the person who committed sin. That's contrast. And that person also disobeys God's law. People who willfully oppose God and his truth are following the devil's lies. Willfully. They choose to. And you can't tell them whether they're right or wrong because it seems like it's right to them. This spirit of disobedience results in a person's spiritual death, ultimately. The devil is another name for Satan. Since the introduction of sin at the beginning, the devil has opposed God and the people of God. The devil's opposition comes through temptation. Therefore, believers should not give place to the devil. Instead, we should make every effort to resist the work of the devil. Verse 8b says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to the earth as a sacrifice for human sins. By doing so, he triumphed over the devil. Although Christ has already won the victory, the devil has power in the world for a time. That power, however, is limited. Someday Christ will return to destroy the devil and the works of the devil. But right now, the struggle is still on. The fight is still on. The pursuit of righteousness is still a future goal. Verse 9 says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. The underlying Greek word translated born appears 10 times in 1 John. All instances of that word in this letter refer to a person's spiritual birth and to being a child of God. People who have experienced that spiritual birth do what is right. They do what is right. Know God and love others. Believe that Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus is the Christ. Overcome the world and will not continue in sin. That's that's what I, the, the, that's my, con, the, there's a lot of controversy about this verse. And you have even, even people here say, I don't sin no more because I'm saved. But the truth is, you don't continue in sin. You don't desire to sin. Sin is not your purposeful platform of uh, plans. Uh, uh, making mistakes is a part of the human nature, but you don't continue to do what you know is wrong. And you are filled with the blood of Jesus, the spirit of God, the anointing of God, the salvation that has come by Christ. God's children will continue to wage war against sin, wage war against its effects. Although we have been released from sin and freed from its condemnation, there is no sin of condemnation once you have been saved by the washing of the blood. Forgiveness is available. Our sinful nature will continue until Christ returns to deliver us. When John says that believers do not commit sin, he does not mean that they will not live perfect lives. Instead, John's words are meant to encourage us to seek godly and upright lives. There's a difference between falling and then living on the ground. There's a difference in walking on the sidewalk 
and occasionally stumping off the sidewalk into the gutter than walking in the gutter and occasionally stepping up on the sidewalk. What am I trying to say? There's a difference between trying and not trying. And even when you falter in your heart, there is one conviction. There's a need for repentance. And there's a strong effort to commit yourself to a life free of that type of behavior. Believers can avoid a life of sin because they have the seed of God in them. That seed is planted when believers receive the gospel. When we receive the Holy Spirit, only through the power of God's spirit that remaineth in us, can we, we fight, resist that sinful nature that is in us. Every day, Every day is a challenge and a struggle in the life of a believer. Verse 10 says, in this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not right or righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. So this verse presents a rubric to distinguish the children of God from the children of the devil. That status is revealed by a person's actions. Children of God act with righteousness. Father, a person's status is also measured by how he or she loves other members of the family of God. As the love of God fills believers, there will be a natural outpouring of love among believers, not hatred, not as animosity, not always demeaning other people. If the love of God is in you, you ought to be a help not a herder, an encourager, not a discourager, a person that lifts others up, not pull them down. So the marks are there. The person who habitually fails to act with righteousness or demonstrate love is not a child of God. The rubric is clear and it is pass or fail in that regard, either you are or you're not. Ain't no middle ground. Either you are or not a child of God. We ought to know God's love has transformed us, but we are still affected by the presence of sin until the ultimate defeat of Satan. We will fail to behave or love as we hope. In the meantime, God has given us tools to help us grow spiritually. He has given us his spirit to transform us into Christ's likeness. God has also provided us with spiritual family, other children of God. These spiritual siblings can encourage us to live according to the design and the desire of who God would have us to be. It's clear. God's children love him and seek lives of righteousness. The rubric is clear. God's children love him and seek lives of righteousness. The love of God. Brother Superintendent, if there are no questions, that is our lesson presentation for Sunday. Love is so